Monaco 64, home of alternative economics and contrarian views. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Steve Santangelo. He, he writes the SRS Rocco Report, and you can find that on srsrockoreport.com. Uh, Steve is an independent researcher. He started investing in precious metals in 2002, and later on in 2008, he started looking at the relationship uh, between the energy market, the financial markets, and the monetary uh, precious metals. So, Steve, uh, thank you for coming on the channel. How are you? Mario, great. Uh, thanks for being here. I think your your listeners uh, will, will find this information quite interesting because it, it's, it's important to understand the main factor that drives the economy and why it's important to be in precious metals. Yes, and uh, I think uh, reading a little bit about your uh, concept and your research, you find that a lot of people in the financial markets or precious metals or energy never look at those three markets uh, being correlated but that's what you're trying to do right yeah you see what's interesting the energy analysts may maybe understand the problems we're going to have with energy but they don't understand why it's important to be in precious metals the precious metal people understand why it's important to be in precious metals but they don't understand the energy why it's important and then the economists they don't understand really precious metals or energy and so it's kind of the blind leading the blind and what i try to do is to reconnect what has been a 2500 year history of energy driving markets and metals gold and silver being money and actually high forms of the collateral and so that's what i'm trying to share with everybody to understand why it's important to be in precious metals yes and before we started we were having a chat and you said that uh my viewers uh, who focus on precious metals, and I focus on precious metals, even though I also cover every market, really ranging from foreign exchange to bonds to energy. Uh, you said that uh, you won't be worried about the price of precious metals when, once they, they listen to you. Well, it, once these fundamentals kick in, because, and, and this is important to talk about because the, uh, the idea that the, the bankers, the elite can manipulate metals if they are doing, I don't think they're really doing that. Uh, and that's due to the cost of production and supply and demand. But the problem we're going to have with energy, which we're going to talk about, it really hurts, destroys the value of most assets the world is invested in. And so that is the fundamental change that will get investors, institutions, investors, hedge funds, high net worth individuals moving more into the precious metals, because this this is the dynamic that I, I, I talk about, which is very important to understand. So you said that you think the uh, energy market is going to destroy a lot of investments. Is that what you, you meant? Uh, because we're seeing like, for example, in Germany, how industry is suffering with the energy crisis. Yes, and industries will suffer even more. And then the asset values, stock market values, company values, real estate values, and bonds. Because what, are, what is a 20, 30 year bond? It's a promise to pay. It's an IOU. Well, the shorter dated ones, the one month, the three month, they're gonna, they're gonna, they're, they're gonna be repaid. But the long, the bond market is gonna get into trouble because we're gonna get into trouble with energy and we're seeing all the massive debt. So this is, this is why it's important to understand what's happening with energy because it's the foundation for the asset values in the world. And right now the market doesn't realize the most important assets, gold and silver, really is the place to be, but they haven't, they haven't connected the dots yet. And would you say uh, this uh, process has been uh, ongoing for decades or is it to blame, is it, uh, do we have to blame what, what's happening in Ukraine and the Russian situation? Because a lot of people are saying that that's what it's about, but I have a feeling you're gonna say, no, it started uh, way before. Yeah, it's been starting before. And when you see some of the, the information we're going to show here, you'll you, you'll understand. But the Russian Ukraine war uh, made the symptoms worse. That's what it did. It, it made the symptomatic problem with energy much worse. And why is Europe in such big trouble? Because Europe is the largest net importer of natural gas in the world. If you look at all the regions, North America, South America, the Middle East, uh, Africa, you look at all these regions. Even Asia, 
Europe is the largest net importer of natural gas. So when you get into trouble with natural gas, who that's they're the canary in the coal mine. And Asia is number two. So it's no coincidence, Mario, we're seeing very high prices of Europe and Asian natural gas. And this is just going to get worse, even though we could have weaker prices next year if there's a recession that it all comes back to haunt us as the problems with this energy cliff I talk about get worse in the years ahead. So do you want to look at some slides now? Sure. Um, if we start, let me just uh, get them up here. Uh, so here we go. Yeah, I think, Mario, this is probably the most important thing for people to realize because a lot of people, a lot of economists don't even understand this. Energy drives the global economy, finance steers the economy. Because you, if you, even if you have, uh, if you're in a car and you want to steer the car, a lot of times you can't even move the steering wheel, but if there's no gas in the car and you can steer the car, you're not going to go anywhere. So it's finance just steers the economy. Energy has been the driver for, for thousands of years. And Silver and gold are what I call stores of energy equivalent value or energy value. They don't store energy. Some people say they store energy. They don't. Because if all we're doing in the world is burning energy to produce goods and services, that's all we're doing. It's very complex. So what stores this energy value has been gold and silver. But that's changed due to the rapid increase of coal, natural gas, and, and oil production. So, and if you go to the next slide, Jean-Marc Jankovici, uh, he's a French engineer. He did a presentation in front of the OECD just back in 2019. And he shows there's a direct relationship between total world oil consumption, three-year average, and total world GDP per capita, three-year average. And, and so when you understand that there is a relationship between energy consumption, production, and and GDP. Well, if you have rising energy production, especially oil, oil is the number one, then you get to have rising GDP, uh, economic activity. If you have falling energy production, then the whole thing, the economic activity starts to decline. And this is bad news because we've got over 300 trillion in debt now, and all these asset values, financial values are overinflated. And so this is an important understanding. Yeah, and uh, it looks like uh, back in the uh, early, late 60s, early 70s, uh, world uh, oil consumption dropped quite sharply, like the, the percentage uh, growth. Yeah, this is the issue, and I'll talk about that. The yeah. more production you add, yeah, you have to add a lot more to get the higher percentage. And so that's why you see the 2%. Do you see the 2% basically is where we've been adding a lot of the uh, around that's that 2% yeah. since the 80s. That's the 2% inflation the Fed goes by, the central banks go by. They want the 2% inflation to match the 2% increase in world oil consumption three-year average. Right. That's what it's based on. But you can't have 2% inflation if production is declining and economic activity is falling. And so this is where the whole financial market unravels due to this scenario. I see. And uh, what about uh, this alternative uh, energy movement? Uh, for example, here in the UK, I interviewed a, a politician. Well, now he's a lord, <laughs> and Lord Lilly, and he voted against the uh, 2008 Climate Change Act uh, here in the UK, which, uh, and he was one of the only five MPs that voted against it. But they, they want to take us away from like hydrocarbons, oil and gas. How, how do you think that's going to impact things? Well, I, I did a report on this and it doesn't impact it that much, even though there is a lot of capital spending on wind and solar. I agree. And let me have put a footnote I do believe there's going, there's going to be climate issues. We're going to have major climate volatility on top of the problems with energy. However, that being said, uh, wind and solar and green energy doesn't solve it. It actually makes it worse. So when, when we understand that dynamic, all the investment in the last 10 years in wind and solar, you know, if we took that money and put it into exploration and production of oil, would have found 
one year's worth of consumption. That's it. So in, in the whole scheme of things, it's not much, but it, it is taking money and funds and capital away from the oil and gas industry. I do get that. But in, in the entire, in, in the nutshell, it doesn't really matter because the problems with energy we're going to have are so big that we're not going to be able to ramp up uh, green energy. Yeah. And I think you've been warning it about this for quite a few years now, haven't you? Yeah. And, and the Russian Ukraine war has just sped the process up because what's happened Prices of fossil fuels have gone through the roof. And now what it takes to produce solar and wind uh, units, they have the prices have gone up s significantly. And so it, it changes the whole dynamic because what is uh, wind and solar? It's a fossil fuel derivative. You cannot make a wind turbine, a blade or solar panel from wind and solar energy. You need the old fashioned fossil fuels, natural gas, coal and oil. Yeah, it's like uh, people who are pushing for electric uh, vehicles. They don't realize that you need a lot of uh, fossil fuels to produce the batteries and uh, to produce the car and to to generate the electricity to power the car as well. Yeah, and uh, you know, you see some of these cars on the on the highway. Uh, they'll say this car has net zero emissions. Well, maybe coming out of the car. But when they go home and they plug that thing into the wall, I can assure you two thirds of the power is coming from, uh, well, nuclear, but uh, it's coming from coal and natural gas. Uh, a lot of that power, that there, those are emissions. And so it, it's kind of a sleight of hand magician thing, but that's, that's, the, that's the problem. It's not really net zero. It's, it's an illusion of net zero. So should we move forward? Sure. Okay, this is what I talk about the energy cliff. Uh, may, some people may not agree with it. That's fine. Everyone has a different opinion. But uh, if you look around, the, we are going to peak in, in, in oil production barrels, and I'll show you why. The other problem is the energy return on investment. And the energy return on investment is a simple equation that allows simple cell organisms, plants, animals, humans, households, businesses, corporations, countries, and empires to survive or fail. If you have a positive energy return on investment, then you're going to survive. But you have to have a very positive energy return on investment in a modern high-tech economy. And what happened was we have been going through the low the highest quality energy first. And if you look at this big chart, as production declines, the cost to produce this oil just goes up and up. So there's less net energy. And that's what we need to understand. There's less net energy that's going to make it to the, to the economy. And these other charts, the thermodynamic uh, oil collapse in future, what these charts represent is the Seneca cliff. And when we look at past civiliz civilizations, and we've got dozens of them, they don't collapse slowly over hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, they tend to collapse quite quickly. And so this, the major collapse tends to happen quite quickly. So this is what we're facing. And unfortunately, I wish I had better news, but when we understand this, we need to understand what we should be doing in the future. So you can go to the next slide unless you have any questions. Yeah, just a question on the uh, falling EROI. Is that because... We went after the like the easy fruit on the tree first, and now it's costing a lot more, and that's why uh, the that uh, return is is falling. Mario, precisely, exactly correct. When we started drilling the wells in Texas, Oklahoma, California, and around the world in the Middle East, these things you've seen the 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 uh, footage, old footage of the the geyser. They came up under pressure. You go down, you know, 1,000, 1,500 feet, and there's this oil under pressure because there's gas in there as well. And so you get the geyser. Well, the back in the 1920s and 30s, the energy return on investment, some of these wells, like the Lakeview Gusher, that thing produced so much oil, they estimate the re energy return on investment was 35,000 to one. Hmm. So when you average all the early oil wells that were easy to get to, very simple technology, the energy return on investment was very high. 
Now we're going to oil sands, which is four to one. We're going to uh, shale oil, which is five to one. Heavy oil, which is also about five to one. And then deep water, which is, is it's in the teens. But we're trying to uh, we're trying to replace our depletion from these old wells that had very high energy return on investment with lower energy return on investment. And unfortunately, when we get to a certain level, it bankrupts the entire economy because the energy can still be in the ground. But unfortunately, it's not economic to produce to sustain our modern high tech economy. And it's all ba it's all based on oil. OK, let's go. Uh, thank you. Uh, let's go to the next slide. There we go. OK, let me and I'll tell you why energy is so important, because everyone remembers you hear about the roaring 20s in the United States. We had the roaring 20s. So. People think, well, the Roaring Twenties was due to American ingenuity. Well, yes, it was. But even if you've got all this ingenuity, the real reason for the Roaring Twenties was the massive increase in oil production in, in the United States. In the 1920s, we're producing almost 2 million barrels a day. That was a 154% increase. And if you look at the little table on the left of there, you're going to see how much global car production. Look how many cars we were producing. The rest of the world was a fraction. So when you've got all these cars, Mario, you need highways, you need hotels, you need restaurants. So because of the massive increase in oil production coming out of Texas and Oklahoma and California, around the United States, we had, to, we had all this wonderful economic activity. The issue is you don't have the economic activity unless you have the oil production growth. And one last thing I'll say, people think that the uh, Roosevelt's New Deal or World War II pulled us out of the 1930s depression. No, it was the oil production growth, 43% 1930s and then 63% 1940s. It was not these things that, like the, uh, the New Deal, that didn't do it. It was the energy. You need the physical energy to drive the economic activity. And the United States in the 1940s, the reason why we won, we won the war was because we were producing 70% of all the oil in the world. We were the Saudi Arabia. And so we were producing one Liberty transport ship a day. Can you imagine that? One Liberty transport ship was being manufactured in the United States every day to supply the allies. So it was, it always comes back to the energy first. And it's interesting though, that uh, in the twenties, uh, oil production went up by 154%. And even though it rose in the thirties and forties, uh, it was uh, a rise less than in the twenties. Maybe that's what triggered uh, the stock market crash and the depression itself. Yeah. And I, the issue was the stock market was uh, the, the depression happened due to fundamental issues of over leverage. Mm. But still, we were able to bring on oil, more oil to bring us out. Here's the issue. In 2009, 8, 9, we had the financial crisis, right? And the Fed came out, Bernanke, and we did zero interest rates. And then we did QE. So people think that was the reason that pulled us out. No, it was the shale oil industry that, that increased production eight and a half million barrels a day. So you can't do it with Fed monetary stimulus without the energy. That's the, that's the caveat. Yeah. If, yeah. You do, if you do the stimulus, the money printing, without the energy production growth, you look like Venezuela. And that's exactly what, where we're headed, unfortunately. Yeah, and that's why the uh, the CPI is going above that two percent now, even though. Correct. Yeah. Correct, and it's going to be based upon the energy inflation, not only oil, natural gas, and coal, because they are the main drivers of the economy. You can go to the next slide. Okay. There we go. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of details. The reason why we're in trouble is we're not finding enough oil, even though we're spending a lot of money. In the last 11 years, we discovered 76 billion barrels of oil. We consumed 320. So you don't have to be a math whiz to, to figure out that that can't be sustainable. And even if we spend double the amount, then we get maybe 150 billion barrels, but we're still consuming twice as much as what we're 
what we're, we're consuming twice as much of what we're discovering. And so this is the problem. Uh, in 2021, we found 3 billion barrels of oil. We spent a half a trillion dollars in the oil and gas industry. Now, back in the 50s and 80s, we were finding 20 billion barrels a year minimum. Now, we can't even find three or four. Even if we double the money, we get five or six. It's still, we're, we're, we're consuming about 30, 28 to 30 billion barrels of oil a year. So this is just a, this is attrition. We're grinding out the reserves and we're not replacing them. And this is why we hit this energy cliff. What about people who talk about the fact that uh, po world population, even though we've hit a, a billion this year, is going to start uh, falling, falling off in the next maybe 50, 100 years? Would that be a positive uh, for oil or are we, are we just too, too far uh, behind in this? Well, if we look at all past civilizations, they do the same thing. They grow and grow and grow, and then they grow so fast. Uh, Joseph Tainer does great work on the collapse of complex societies. And what collapsed them is the complexity and then the energy. They, they don't have the energy to continue growing. And it, we're, we're, this is, we've done this over and over. We just don't learn from history. Yeah. And I've got a great chart showing the correlation between energy production and world population. And if you go back to 2000 years, it was wood fuel that drove our economies. And then in the, in the 1700s, England figured out how to smelt iron with coal rather than wood. And we've been using wood, a lot of wood. And so then they, they, that's why they became the leading empire in the world for 50 years. And then the rest of the world started using coal. And then we moved to oil and natural gas. When you see the population start to really increase uh, when we hit the industrial revolution with coal, it goes up exponentially when we bring oil. And it's amazing, Mario, when you look at the oil production chart and you look at the world population, they're identical. So when oil production declines, unfortunately, that's what drives our green revolution, our food revolution is the energy. It's the natural gas, the oil. It takes a massive amount of energy to produce food. And so when you lose the production of oil, we're not going to be able to keep up the food production. And unfortunately, the population will, will lower just for, and it has nothing to do with the elite because there's an idea that the elite are trying to do this. The, no, it's all based on the oil production and there's the oil production and the decline will, will be the force that changes the, 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 the dynamics of the population and the economy. So, yeah, what you're saying then it's the energy, uh, production and supply decreasing that will uh, lead to a decrease in population and not the other way around. That's correct. Uh, and, and it's because when you see the chart of the oil production going up, yeah, it, it the, the population matches the line. Uh, I mean, almost exactly. Yeah. And, and, and so, because we have to remember, uh, like the idea that people say, well, we can go to coal, we can move more to coal. There's a lot of coal in the world, but how do you extract coal? You've got mining equipment and trucks, and then you put it on a ship, you put it on a train, you put it on a, on a truck. Well, those are all powered by diesel. Yeah. So you need the oil to extract the coal. So if oil gets into trouble, coal production gets into trouble and natural gas production gets into trouble trouble and the whole thing starts to come down and you know i'm not saying this is good news but i think people most people want to know what's happening they want to know the truth and so the th this is the dynamic that i've seen that's happened in past history over and over we're just doing it on a much bigger global scale okay uh, next slide sure here we go okay I'm going to show you in, in the next few slides, you're going to see why the shale has been so important. The problem, the United States has become the leading producer of oil, natural gas, liquids, petroleum in the world. We produce roughly one out, one out of every five barrels. We're, the world's producing close to a million barrels of petroleum liquids a day. The United States is producing 19 million barrels a day. The growth has come from shale. And what this chart shows, Mario, each year, you'll see each year is put on top of each other, and then the, you'll see the decline rate. That's the natural decline rate if you don't add any new wells. So we could see in the first year, 
peak production in 2019, if you don't add any new wells, it falls four mil, almost 4 million barrels a day. And then it continues to fall. Well, we've been able to increase production and offset these declines because we've been ramping up and drilling more wells. But these, these wells drilling locations are not unlimited. And now the, we're running out of these, we're, go, we're peaking in the amount of these drilling locations. And then that's the reason why we're, go, we're starting to see the peak in shale production. Shale production was a boom, and now it's going to be a bust. So it, it allowed the world and the United States to go back to go to Walmart, Walt Disney and Starbucks for another 10, 15 years. But I, I, my forecast is we're going to have a collapse of shale production by 2030, 2035. It's going to end where it started in about 2011, 12. And, and so when you realize that the, the world, the growth came from the U.S. And if, if you go to the next slide, please. Before I get to that, the EIA, it's the U.S. Energy Information Agency. They put out a forecast of U.S. oil production. They have this drilling productivity report. And so what they're showing, this is the Eagle Ford. There are five major oil fields, shale fields in the United States. The Eagle Ford is like number three. The Bakken is number two. The Permian is number one. What they're showing in this chart is a nice 45 degree increase in oil production. Now, it doesn't match the choppy rest of the chart. Now, if you go to the next slide, I subscribe to Shell Profile that is now Navi. This is the realistic. It, they only have the data up until Ju June, July, but you'll notice the trend is lower. It, it, it's not going up. And so I believe the EIA is mistakenly overestimating production uh, from the shale fields because we're not seeing an increase in, in, in production. And unfortunately, this just gets worse because look at these decline rates. Look how severe they are. And on the Eagle Ford, the Bakken has passed the halfway mark of their drilling locations. And now when you pass the halfway mark, you peak and decline. So even though they can keep production up higher for a while, soon they will start to decline and they, they just don't have the economic drilling locations available to continue growing production. What about people who say that the current administration uh, hurt the uh, shale, uh, shale oil industry in the U.S.? Uh, did they actually uh, say, uh, or is it more related to, to what's going on um, in the drilling and uh, how much they find? Yeah, it's really the drilling and the reserves, the available reserves. Uh, and it's, when you have a 45% decline rate, you've got to replace 4 million barrels a day just to stay where we are. Mm. And if, if you hear that siren in the background, that just goes to show you the trouble that the <laughs> energy industry is facing. But there is some truth to what they're saying. Uh, uh, and the problem is, Mario, the federal lands where there are some drilling locations, it's nine, 10,000 drilling locations. We've drilled 112,000 already. So 9,000 is not much. It's less than 10%. So, so they stopped uh, drilling in federal land. No, they're still drilling. They're still drilling in federal lands. Yeah. And unfortunately, a lot of the reserves on the federal lands isn't that great. Oh, so okay. even though they may have drilling locations, they, they stick with their best quality. And yeah. so this is, this is the issue. 90% of the drilling locations are in private lands. And that's where the problem is. The, the federal lands, even though there's some there, it's not really that much. It won't really stop the problem of, of the decline rate. So it's more of a political uh, argument. Yes. I guess we could uh, say that, uh, the current administration has been unlucky. <laughs> it's all about timing. Right. Yeah, it's uh, there's a lot of unfortunate political BS uh, trying. And, you know, we were we we are still a net exporter, but we're not going to be for much longer. And so uh, the problems the United States is going to face with the U.S. dollar is going to be due to when our oil production starts to decline. And in a few years, I think our natural gas production will decline as well. And that's bad news, Mario, because we have changed 
our our electricity and that's a, that's a, that's a subject for another day we have altered our electric grid to go to green energy and natural gas and that is very bad news for the sustainability of the u.s grid in the future okay so next slide here we go this is what i want to show uh the viewers from 97 to 2008 the financial crisis the rest of the world brought on most of the new growth we have to remember as john Manjakovi showed us uh world gdp is based on oil production growth well the rest of the world added like 11.4 million barrels a day. Since the financial crisis in 2008, it flipped. You see that olive color, it didn't really go up much. Where did it go up? The blue and the red. Blue is US, red is, the, uh, is Canada. 11.8 million barrels a day of production growth came from the US and Canada. That's, that's where the economic growth came from. Since 2018, even though we had the pandemic shutdown, we haven't had any growth. And that's why we've added 55 trillion in debt since 2019, 55 trillion. Yeah. That's 20, I think it's 20% of all the debt in the world was added in just in the last few years. So when you understand the growth came from the United States, some from Canada, 80% from the US, if the shale oil industry declines at 45% a year and we, get, we start to get into trouble, the rest of the world gets into trouble because the rest of the world does not have the growth potential to offset the declines coming from the United States. And soon we're having declines in other parts of the world. Even the Russia oil minister said a few years ago, Russia was going to peak 2023. So this just gets worse. And my date I put out there, Mario, is about 2025. Uh, now, I could be wrong on the timing, but it's not going to be much. That's when we really start to get into trouble. That's when these declines really start to kick in. I see. It's interesting because the, I'm in the UK and uh, I, I moved here in 1992, but mm -hmm. I read about the fact that uh, the UK found a lot of North Sea oil in the late yes. 70s, early 80s. And the UK economy did really well from the early 70s. I would argue up until the beginning of the 2000s. And uh, if you look at the FTSE 100 index, uh, it's around 7,000 right now. And it was 7,000 in the year 2000. Uh, maybe it's because uh, North Sea oil is just going down. Uh, I don't follow it too much. Maybe you can um, uh, clarify that. No, you're correct. Uh, you're correct. Uh, and also, England, the, the United Kingdom gets a lot of its economic activity also from uh, doing a lot of financial. Uh, they're still around. They have the financial hubs around the world, and that really does help. But no, you're correct. It's tied to the North Sea. See, people think that when they discover oil, like we did in Alaska, the North, and we'll get into that, when you discover oil, it's not going to last forever. And you get the best quality, you, and then it de declines. And that but the UK still imports a lot. And now they're getting into trouble. Um, and you know what's interesting? In 1913, that was the peak of the, the, um, the British Empire. Why? They peaked in coal production in 2013. And then it's no coincidence that we went into World War I. Uh, and then it became who controlled the oil. And that was because coal is still important, especially in China. They, pr they produce half of all the coal in the world. Then it, it, it transitioned to who was going to control the oil because that's the number one energy source. And if energy drives the economy, gosh, you got to control the oil. And that was, that's the reason why the Allies, after World War I, controlled a lot of the Middle East, or a lot of the places around the world, because that's where the energy came from. Okay. Let's go to the next slide. Here we go. And this will end up here. The natural decline rate is very important. I could talk about this for an hour. What has happened, and this is what your, your, your viewers need to understand, back in 97, because production was lower, there's a, there's a, the natural decline rate was about 5.7 million barrels a day. We increased production. We added smaller fields offshore that declined faster. So the decline rate now is seven and a half million barrels a day. You got to replace that every year. 
Then we brought on shale, which, as I showed you, declines 45% a year. So when you add the U.S. shale industry, now we're losing a tenth of the oil every year. So it's just math. It's just math. And you can't, and we, we can't spend enough money now to replace this kind of decline rate. And so because we, if we kept production, let's say at 45 or 50 million barrels a day, we could have extended our reserves for a long period of time, but we brought it on, we continue to grow production. And so this is the problem we face. And this is why I believe 2025 plus or minus is when these declines really start to show up. And that's when we get to see extreme volatility in the energy prices. And that's when currency is going to get into trouble, especially the dollar. And that's why also it's important to be in physical precious metals. Okay. Uh, it's interesting. Yeah. You were talking about in the previous slide about that 2025. So there's the, uh, the forecast there. Yeah. That's, that's my forecast yet yeah, again, yeah. you know, we can be wrong. I can be wrong on the timing, but I, I do think the fundamentals are correct. Let's go. Oh, yeah, there you go. Okay, let's go. Let, now we're going to look into some of the, uh, yeah, because I, I've uh, spoken about uh, Lindsay Williams and uh, the uh, energy non-crisis, and I'm glad to have you on to, to talk about this because sure. there's a lot of misunderstanding uh, about this, uh, especially when Liz, Lindsay Williams said that there's uh, enough uh, oil reserves in the north slope of Alaska to last 300 years. Uh, so uh, maybe you could uh, talk about this and uh, give your view on it. Well, I'm probably not going to change everyone's mind because you see, the issue is this. I showed you the numbers and these numbers don't lie. The, and the energy return on investment doesn't lie. Uh, and there are oil, there are independent oil geologists that are all throughout the United States. If they knew there was 300 years or 200 years of oil in Alaska, the world would know it. Uh, but we're going to talk about that. So Lindsay Williams, I believe, is a good man. Jerome Corsi, they're doing and they're sharing what they think is right. But when you when you go and look at the numbers and look at what's happening the way I do uh, and other people, there's not many doing it. You'll you'll realize when you look at the, the facts and the data that uh, there is there isn't the oil there. And even if there is, it's not much. So if you want to go to the next slide. Yeah. Okay. This is an article, huge Alaskan oil reserve go unused. And it says all of our energy problems could have been solved in the seventies with the huge discovery on the Gull Island. Uh, oddly enough, immediately after the massive discovery, the federal government ordered the rigs to be capped and oil production shut down. Well, we don't, people think there's all these oil wells that are capped you don't do that. It, if you cap a well, it destroys the ability of that well to produce oil. The oil, oil industry only caps wells if there's an issue with the well or if we have a pandemic shutdown and they're forced to. Because when you bring back on that well, it, there's, there's issues and it's expensive to do that at times. So we don't cap wells and we don't bring them on. So that, that's a falsehood. The issue is there, there is oil. Um, and BP was going to access that oil. And I'll show you how much oil was really there and the reason why they did not move forward with getting this oil. This is the biggest uh, rig, drilling rig in the world. It's called the Liberty Onshore Arctic Drilling Rig. And it was going to tap into the Liberty Oil Reserve. And so if you, if you go to the next slide, and I mean, this is a massive, this is this thing that if you look at that, if you look at this, the graphic, that was all man-made. You know how expensive it is to do that? Think of the difference of a Texas oil man in the 1920s getting a simple wooden derrick and, and then drilling down and all this oil comes out. Look what they had to do in the Arctic to get this drilling rig to work. And it's the, it's the biggest. And it's not the biggest because Lindsey Williams said there's the biggest oil field. I'll show you why it's the biggest rig in the world. Okay, Lindsey Williams, and unfortunately the video we had, uh, li the Liberty rig is, is going to tap into this oil. So he did say that, the Liberty rig. Right. If you go to the next slide, 
This is the BP Liberty Oil Reservoir. So there is, there was a reservoir and they estimate there was about 500 million barrels of oil there and what they could extract economically, because even though there's a lot of oil, you can only get so much out. They, they were going to get 100 million barrels. That's, and this is the proven reserve by independent oil geologists. If you can go to the next slide. And that's not much, 100 million barrels. No, no. And I can throw some figures. The reason the Liberty Rig was so big, look what it had to do. Oh, yeah. It had to get to their Liberty Reservoir that was about six to eight miles away from where they were building it. And it had to drill a six to eight mile horizontal well. Well, the fracking industry has pretty big rigs that they drill about a mile down and they go out about a mile and a half, two miles. That's it. That's, that's all they do. To do a six to eight mile horizontal well, you need a massive rig that can able to have the torque to do that and to be able to get into the Liberty Reservoir. And that's why it was very expensive to do that. If you can go to the next slide, then what happened? So they were building this in, they were putting this together in 2009, they were doing this in 2010. Then all of a sudden we had the, the deep water horizon blowout in April, 2020. Massive disaster, massive disaster. Uh, and so it caused a lot of economic da damage to BP as well as ecological damage. If you look at the next slide, this was BP response. November 20th, BP suspends construction work at the Liberty Rig. And then if we look at the uh, July 8th, 2012, BP suspends the costly elastic oil project. And basically, they would have got about 40,000 barrels a day and they would have had to spend more than 1.5 billion. This is the energy return on investment. And they realized if we got to drill this six to eight mile horizontal well in, in the Alaska pristine environment, what they just went through in the Gulf of Mexico, they did not want to ha have any more problems. So the, the deep water horizon disaster forced BP to suspend the, uh, the, the Liberty Project because the technical challenges were too great. And, and they, they just went through this massive disaster, deep water horizon. And so they just decided. And about four or five years later, 2020, they dismantled the whole rig. It's gone. They're not going to do that. And so this, is, this here is a perfect example of the falling energy return on investment. So they were going to try to get this oil. There was some oil there, not much. And if, even if we, even if we say there's 20 billion barrels of oil, that's some of the estimates people put out in Alaska everywhere, 20 billion barrels. Mario, that's, that's nine months of, of the global oil consumption. It's, it's nothing. No, we're just right. producing and consuming way too much oil now. Yeah, it seems like uh, this... Uh... Lindsay William uh, Williams forecast and other people about 200 years of oil there. Uh, they didn't really look at the uh, like the geology or the cost. <laughs> and uh, I think earlier this year, there was a story that came out from Uganda saying that they discovered 12 trillion worth of gold reserves in Uganda. <laughs> and I think that's a little bit of a, an exaggeration as well, but similar to this. No, you're exactly right, because I looked at that article and it's not really that much, but the the average ore grade is so low, it's not economic. Okay. You see, that's that's that, that that's the problem. And to 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 conclude in this, you know, again, uh, Lindsey Williams thought what he was doing correct. But the problem comes down to <clears throat> what's happening with with the figures and Again, some people will continue to believe what Lindsey Williams said, but there are independent oil geologists that understand what's happening. And if they knew there was this much oil out there, we would be drilling it. And like, why would we, why would we be drilling shale oil, which up till recently, the U.S. shale industry hasn't made money. They, had, they actually 
accumulated 300 billion in debt. Well, now they're starting to pay some of that debt down. Why would we go to shale oil? That's very expensive to produce. And you need hundreds of thousands of wells. If we had all this oil in Alaska, it, it, you see, it, it sounds good, but it doesn't make economic sense. And so the reason is there just isn't the oil there and the energy return on investment is too low. And one last thing, we hear a lot of oil reserves. We've got uh, a trillion barrels of oil shale in Wyoming. Well, the energy return on investment of oil shale, you got to crush the shale. It's not, it's not tight oil that's hidden in shale deposits. It's oil that's in shale. You got to crush that. Then you got to heat it. Its energy return investment is so low. It's less than two to one. And we need as a world 12 to one energy return on investment from our oil to sustain this massive high-tech global economy. And that's why the energy return on investment shows us why we're getting into trouble and why we're adding all this debt now in the world to offset this falling energy return on investment. The same thing the Romans did it, it, back when they debased their currency, they were offsetting the falling energy return on investment of the Roman Empire based on wood fuel. Let's see. Uh, next slide. Okay, now we get, we get into the, the fun stuff. Uh, why this matters to be in precious metals. The energy problems we're going to have are, are going to be pro very problematic, and I don't have all the solutions. But I do believe if you're going to have investments, you need to be in physical precious metals. And so a lot of people put out charts uh, about what the charts of the, you know, the cup and handle of gold, and, and we see what's happening with the gold price and, and the silver price. It's all based on the energy. And so what we see here the first bull market in the oil price was due to the oil price, uh, the gold price was oil price inflation. The oil price went from $1.80 in 1970 to $36 in 1980. Well, I can assure you, if you're producing gold like home stake mining, your, your cost to produce gold exploded. So the price went up, but the price went up so high, it went up well above the cost of production. And then we see it trended for about two decades. And then the next bull market in oil and gold happened. Now, why did the bull market in oil happen? Because we peaked in conventional oil production in 2005, six. Actually, conventional oil, which is the good stuff, has been actually declining now. And we've been making it up with shale oil, oil sands, deep, deep water. And so this is the reason why we're having the high oil prices is because we're peaking in conventional oil production. And soon, we peak in unconventional, and then we get very high oil prices. And so this is the reason why we're seeing the huge increase in the price of gold. It's all based on the energy. What about the uh, credit or monetary inflation? Does that have an impact as well? Because uh, I, I usually uh, look at that as uh, like the debt that's been created, because you could superimpose also the U.S. national debt on that chart, and it would kind of match uh, the price of gold. Yes, and I, I think the issue is there's two different things happening. There's the inflation, oil inflation. Uh, there's the debt, but the the market bases everything on cost of production. So the entire global economy is based on cost of production. So whatever it takes to get a good or service to the market then there's a profit. If the profits are really high, what happens? You get competitors coming in, putting, doing it for a lower price. So when we look at the entire global economy, everything has a cost of production. And then when it gets finally to the store, the store has to have its profit margin for its workers. And so that's, everything has a cost of production and a margin. The same thing with gold and silver, copper, yeah. all the metals. Yeah. The difference is you're right. The, you see, this is the difference. The energy price and the cost of production puts a floor in the price of gold. And right now, it's about fifteen fifty to produce an ounce of gold. And I don't think we're going to see it fall too much below that. The other issue is when you peak in oil production and the economy starts to roll over, all the other asset values get into trouble, but not gold and silver. And so this... So we go into phase two, the world wakes up that they're invested in the wrong assets. And these assets 
are based on growing energy production. And so that's when the price of gold and silver are going to disconnect from the cost of production, and they're going to increase in value due to the increased demand, because the institutions and investors in the world want to protect their wealth. And you can't do it in, in, in stocks and bonds and real estate as we roll over this energy cliff. And that's, that's what I'm trying to educate the precious metal investors in the world about. And uh, what about other hard assets like commodities? Do you think they will reflect that as well, like gold and silver? Yes, of course. Food is very important, right? We're going to see food price inflation. Uh, the world is, is going to get back to things that are very important. I think technology is going to suffer uh, because technology, people think that technology makes things more efficient. It doesn't. Technology just consumes more energy, but you don't notice it because if you go on Amazon, you buy something, the next day it's there. Well, it almost looks like, and this is the joke I say, Mario, it, we've got the Star Trek replicator economy. You push a button and there, there it is. No, no, no. That took a massive supply chain that's burning a massive amount of energy to get that good on your doorstep. And so we are going to see inflation. Uh, this is how I look at it in a nutshell. We're going to get deflation in things you own, stocks, bonds, real estate, boats, cars, and inflation in things you consume, energy, goods, those are going to go up, but they, they can't go up too high because then people can't afford them and the demand falls. So this, it's going to be very volatile as time goes on. Have you got any idea uh, of, for, have you got any forecasts of uh, the uh, price of uh, crude oil or gold, or is it something that it's difficult to, to say what it's going to be? I think we're going to be quite surprised how high the metals are going to go because you know why and i'll show you we will get to that slide in, in a minute there's just not that much gold and silver there are the the global assets in the world is over 400 trillion that's real estate stocks and bonds 400 trillion all the gold and silver investment in the world is about four and a half trillion there's a hundred times more money or funds in in these other assets and you have to remember, if oil production declines, that means there's less people driving around, less buses, less traffic, less trucks. And what does that do to the economic activity in that area? It's going to happen everywhere, but let's just say a town. Then the, then the economic activity declines. What does that do to real estate prices? They decline. Everything starts to decline. Well, if you're an investor, you don't want to hold on to things that are going to decline. You want to hold on to things that hold value. And so just getting a couple, a trillion or two trillion, just one or two percent of that 400 trillion into the metals, you can double the prices, triple the prices easy. Again, I don't speculate on the price. I think we could see $200 crude oil spikes, but that can't be sustainable because the market can't afford it. So that's why it's very going to be very volatile. And so Unfortunately, another thing we need to understand, the world economy survives on stable prices. But when they become very volatile, this is very disruptive to the global economy. And we're seeing that now. And so, again, I don't have the solutions for the world, but I do know if you're going to invest in things, you, the, the sound investments are going to be gold and silver. There are, there are others, but, the, you know, keep it simple, stupid, 2,500 years Gold and silver have been protecting wealth because they're stores of energy value. And uh, mining, mining companies, how do you think they're going to do? Because I guess they're going to suffer from uh, cost uh, increases. But at the same time, the price of gold and silver going up uh, faster than the uh, cost, that could still help them, right? Yes, I believe the primary silver and gold miners, and I talk about this to my subscribers, will do well for a while. The base metal mining industry is going to get hurt uh, because there's, as energy production declines, you're going to have less diesel, less fuel to drive uh, the ability to extract metals. And if you look at a chart of oil production, like I talked about population, and you overlay copper and, and aluminum and iron production and gold and silver, they all go up the same way. 
they all go up. And that's all due to the oil and natural gas and coal. And so if you decline in oil production, you, you, we're going to decline in metal production. But the miners, the primary gold and silver miners may hold up better for a while because for, I like the silver miners because silver takes 100 times less energy to produce an ounce of silver than gold. Gold, that's why the price of gold is so high. It's a massive consumer of energy, massive. And so, and so is the copper industry. So is the iron industry. And these are just massive consumers of energy. So yes, uh, but I, I do think gold and silver miners will hold up better for a while, not forever, for a while as we start to roll over the energy cliff. Okay, next uh, slide. Here we go. This is an important subject to understand. Back when gold and silver used to be money, when banks held gold and silver in their vaults, they were massive stores of this energy equivalent value. So the profitable, you see, when you have energy driving, like let's say during the, um, during the 1920s, energy, all that wonderful oil the United States was following, was driving the car production, we were building roads and new restaurants and all this, the roaring 20s. Well, the, the, the profits of this energy was held in gold and silver. And a lot of that was held at the banks. So that's where the value, that's where the store of energy was held. Well, we debased the currency. And now if you look at the banks today, they only have paper currency and digital uh, money at, at the banks. That's all they have. So they're not stores of value. Because I, I, I talk about it, it takes... It takes about 13, it takes about $1,550 to produce an ounce of gold. You can produce about 12 $100 bills, which is $1,200, $1,300 for about $2. Or let's say we do 12 or 15 $100 bills, that cost about $2.5. That, that's $1,500 worth of currency. But it took the gold mining industry $1,500 to produce an ounce of gold, where it took the Federal Reserve, the U.S. Treasury, about two and a half dollars to make $1,500 worth of gold bills. And the reason why fiat currency doesn't have any value, it's, it's all about the energy. It doesn't take much energy to make money, to print money. It doesn't take much energy at all. Matter of fact, you can make those bills for a few pennies, but they have to be anti counterfeit. So they're very expensive. So why is fiat currency? doesn't have any value because there's no energy. It doesn't take much energy to produce it. Again, Mario, it always comes back to the energy. Interesting. Uh, and what about, until you look at uh, Bitcoin, any, any views on that? Some people say that you, you need a lot of energy to, to code, to create, create a block. Yes. Uh, I'm not a big believer in Bitcoin. It's a speculation, but it's true. Bitcoin, it takes energy, a massive amount of energy to produce Bitcoin. Uh, the problems we're going to have with technology is that it's not going to be sustainable. And you need a massive amount of energy to continue running the system that allows Bitcoin to function. So I don't, I'd rather have my gold and silver on me than have to rely upon a very complex global internet high tech system to trade because you need a, you need a bitcoin miner to to sell a bitcoin or to trade in bitcoin or to use bitcoin for a transaction that's not centralized decentralized that's centralized decentralized is when i go to my go my gold dealer or the pawn shop and i i bring in 10 silver eagles and i sell them that's decentralized so Gold and silver are really the only decentralized, sustainable stores of value because they're stores of energy value. I don't trust Bitcoin and a lot of the cryptos in the future. I don't think they're going to hold up very well. Okay. So this is, this is what we already talked about. This is an old chart. Unfortunately, it's much higher now. Again, stocks and bonds and real estate are not stores of value. What are they? their energy IOUs. And Mario, why is that the case? If you look at a stock, what is its price? It's price to earnings. Well, it gets its earnings by growth. If an investor or the market realized the growth was over for the stock, 
what's going to happen to the earnings are going to fall. So why would you invest in the stock? And what are the earnings based on? Growth and economic growth and economic growth, as I proved, is based on oil production growth. And so the entire equity market gets into trouble as energy production declines. We don't, the market doesn't know it yet, but it's, that's what it's facing. And then securitized debt, which are bonds, they get into big trouble because they are an IOU. A bond is basically a, an IOU to pay it back. And then, of course, real estate, people have to own a house, but the values of real estate are really going to decline. And so the alternative, the true alternative, the true liquid value, and you have to think about this, gold and silver are going to be very liquid to sell. Think about 100 homes in a suburb. As energy production declines, less economic activity, people are going to start selling homes, but pretty soon or in a while. There, you're not going to be able to sell your house because why? The, the problems are going to get so severe that homes are not going to have a bid in in a very in his, in the suburbs in a lot of the big suburbs and big cities, and so they're not going to be liquid. You, you you may have to sell your house at fifty cents on the dollar, so it's not liquid, and that's the problem today, Mario, with a lot of these assets, the derivatives. They're not going to be liquid, so you always get back to the Exeter pyramid. And the Exeter pyramid based on energy shows that gold and silver are the most liquid assets because they're very easy to sell. It's going to be very hard to sell these other assets in the future, especially as we head over the energy cliff. And so I think this is one of the last slides. This is what it comes down to. I just updated this. Uh, the global identifiable physical gold and silver, there's about 2.5 billion ounces of all the gold investment, that's central bank, and that's also private investment. And there's about 4.4 billion ounces of silver, maybe more, maybe 5 billion. Uh, and that's ETF, that there's not much central bank silver. And then there's a lot of held privately, especially in the last 15 years. A lot of coin and bar has been in, purchased and held by the public. So this is all the 4.6 trillion of gold and 97 billion of silver based on current values. Again, when investors start to move into this limited supply, even though we could there's scrap that could come on the market, even if it doubles to 10 billion ounces of silver and we can go up to maybe three or three and a half billion ounces of gold, that's still not much at all. And so I think this is the issue. The next phase of the bull market in the metals is going to be when the world understands the dynamics of the energy cliff and the impacts it's going to have negatively on most asset values. They're going to have to move into precious metals to protect wealth. And there's just not much of it there. I've heard that the total amount of physical uh, uh, gold is like 10 trillion. Is that like adding like jewelry and other uh, uh, gold outside the investable and central bank market? Yes, there, there's probably, there is a lot of gold jewelry there. Uh, a lot of that is in India. A yeah. lot of it is, but even if we, we see 10 trillion, again, you know, it's, the problem that the world is facing is there's just not a, enough good um, liquid assets. And th the market forgot about it because we, we placed our faith in these other assets because, you know, you, you, people get into real estate. Real estate has been a proven asset investment. Real estate prices are always going to go up. Well, no, you know, real estate prices are going to start coming down and they're only driven by energy growth. And so, you know, you look at a typical suburban home, I don't know wherever you live, it needs a lot of energy. You've got to maintain it. You need constant amount of energy, not only to have the economy around a home, to support a home, but to, to support the house economy. You need energy. You, you need to maintain, cut grass. It takes a lot of energy to keep that house giving of its value. And so we don't realize this really does change, unfortunately, as we get into trouble. We move into energy scarcity, and that becomes problematic to the world. And, and the world, it hasn't, the light bulbs haven't gone off yet, but they will, I would say in the next five to 10 years, more light bulbs are going to go off. And so when you see that, you know, that the last chart, but when you see 
the the chart of Tesla. People go, oh, I wish I got into Tesla when it was here because it went to here. They're going to say the same thing about the metals. And it all comes into conclusion. It comes to this. If you look at the world debt in 2005, it was 127 trillion. I think in 2008, it was 150 trillion. It doubled since the financial crisis. And what was that due to? The decline in the falling energy return on investment. This is the world's way, the central banks and the world's way to offset the falling energy return on investment. And then we've added all this debt and now interest rates are going up. We can't even service this debt. And so it, it becomes a snowball, but it, we've been managing this debt because we've been able to increase oil production. When you can't increase oil production, all this leverage, as you know, the derivatives, all this leverage gets into serious trouble. So one could say that the, the uh, prospects for, for the world, not, not just the West, but even uh, China, Russia, it's not very good. But at least uh, we can, as individuals, protect ourselves uh, with gold and silver as an investment. And, and how do you see the world? I, I know you look at energy and investments, but mm -hmm. any, any views on how the world is going to look, uh, let's say, economically, socially, and politically with what's going on? Because from what you're telling me, uh, and I'm not surprised, it's the decline of uh, the Industrial Revolution. It's the end of it. You know, I, I, the only thing I can be wrong on is the timing. But when you look at the numbers, when you see the decline rate, and these are real uh, calculatable decline rates that are happening, it's very hard to maintain this. And so that's when you, but the Roman Empire did the same thing. The, the late Bronze Age, they did the same thing. We see the same processes over and over. This is just on a much more global scale. The, the way I look at how things are going to unfold, the biggest problems are going to happen to though, and we're seeing it, to the, the areas and the countries that are the most reliant on energy imports. Europe is most reliant on natural gas imports. Asia is number two. Asia is most reliant on oil imports. Europe is number two. And so... Even though China is, people think China is this growing economy, they're going to, they got the Belt Road Initiative and the, 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 the BRICS, and that's all true. I don't disagree, you know, I don't disagree with that. China is going to have the same problems the rest of the world is. Their growth has come from a lot of imports of energy. Well, if, you, if, the, if the imports of energy are going to decline, well, so is the Chinese miracle. And the Belt and Road Initiative is not going to last. I mean, I, I put out the statistic that just mind boggles in in the last three years, China has produced more cement, concrete, than the United States has done in the last 100. Think about that. And, and so they, they have gone, they have, they have went from an agrarian economy to a high-tech high -tech metropolis in two, two and a half decades, which took Europe and the United States almost 100 years to do. They did it in 2025. Well, you know what? You go up fast you come down fast. And so you're right, the rest of the world is going to get into trouble. And I would say this, the countries that are the net exporters of energy and goods are going to survive longer than those who are the net importers or highly reliant on energy. And we're seeing that problems right now. A lot of third world countries like Sri Lanka, the prices of you know, food, it just gets worse. It just gets worse as time goes on. So like Russia... They're, they export two thirds of their oil. So they're going to survive longer. Canada will probably do well because they export a lot of their oil. So, so it's going to play out differently, but those currencies and those countries that are net energy exporters and goods exporters, their currencies are going to hold up better than those countries that are major importers. And we're going to get back to the old fashioned way of doing things based on real things and that's coming steve thank you very much uh for your time uh, i'm uh, definitely having you on again if that's okay with you and uh, i'd like to thank you for being on the channel mario i know this went a little bit long but i do think if people understand this information uh they'll, they'll connect the dots and they'll see why it's important to be in precious metals but yes i would i would love to talk again and uh because i think we're going to see some big changes in the next few years and the market unfortunately isn't prepared for it
and I guess uh, the viewers can go to srsroccoreport.com to find all your work. Are you on any other platforms? Yeah, we, um, I do. I put out some public articles, but I have the gold and silver members where I spend 55, 60 hours a week detailing these changes that are happening. It's important to know the changes. And then I, I'm on, I'm on uh, Twitter. I have a Twitter uh, handle and I put out some of the information there as well as my YouTube channel. But we need to understand the, the, the changes that are happening with energy because energy is the driver of the economy. So when you, when we understand that energy drives the economy. We need to understand what's happening with energy. Then we can we can we can understand all these the policies that are changing, all these things that are happening, and or some of the superstitious things or meaningless things that are happening uh, are are more political and not realistic. Great, thank you very much, Steve. H have a great day, and talk to you later. Thank you, Mario. You too.